for my birthday, by the way, um, on Christ or Carols. And uh, each week of Advent, we're going to take one of our beloved Christmas carols and talk about the meaning of the carol and also, oftentimes, the story behind the carol. And so today we're going to do one of my favorite carols, which is A Little Town of Bethlehem. We're going to be reading from uh, the prophet Micah, chapter 5, the verses of 1 through 5. He begins by talking about uh, uh, a situation of despair in, in Israel and in Samaria. Received, but then notice the shift rather quickly in this passage to a much more a hopeful vision uh, of the future for the people of God. Let's listen to God's word to us. Now you, now you are walled around with a wall. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the ruler of Israel upon the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem of Apophra, who are one of the little clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. O little town of Bethlehem, this beloved carol is not only a pro, uh, prof built on profoundly moving lyrics and not only a hauntingly beautiful tune, but it is also based on a very accurate historical fact, and that is that Bethlehem was indeed a very little town. So little, in fact, that it did not appear on the earliest of Hebrew maps. So little, in fact, that it wasn't even counted among the clans of Judah. So little that when the prophet Micah refers to it in our reading, he has to call it Bethlehem of Apocra, so that it won't be confused with Bethlehem of Zebulun, its much bigger cousin. Bethlehem was truly a little town. Just five miles northwest of Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, home of the Holy Temple, the aristocrats, the well-to-do in the community, the royalty. And then there were other much larger towns, such as Shechem, Shiloh, and Hebron, all far more impressive cities than Bethlehem. I mean, in comparison to these places, Bethlehem was kind of the runt of the litter. It was the backwoods of the backwoods, if you will. And yet, the little town of Bethlehem has long, had long been great in God's plan because smallness is no barrier to greatness when it comes to God's economy. We first encounter Bethlehem's greatness in the story of Ruth and Naomi. When these two women found themselves widowed and defenseless, they returned to Bethlehem, which was Naomi's home. There they found a kind and a generous people led by Boaz, who provided for them by allowing Ruth to glean from the wheat and the barley fields, as was commanded in the Jewish law. Blessed be the town, blessed be the nation that welcomes and cares for immigrants, widows and orphans such as Ruth and Naomi. For God will call such as these great. We encounter Bethlehem again later in Israel's history when Saul was faltering as Israel's first king. It was then that God directed the prophet Samuel to go to Bethlehem. Because God knew that it was in a town like Bethlehem, a town that would welcome immigrants, that they would be able to find a king. A king after God's own heart. 
Indeed, it was there in Bethlehem that Samuel found a man named Jesse who had seven sons. Jesse's oldest son should have gotten the job of being the king according to ancient Near Eastern custom. And yet, all five of the brothers, uh, all seven, six of the brothers, were all rejected. Almost as an afterthought, they went out and they fetched their youngest brother, a boy named David, who was out in the field tending to the sheep. That was the job that you gave to the kid, you know, who got the last, you know, kind of, uh, the leftovers in the meal and so on and so forth. It was a bad job that you gave to the kid who you know, was just kind of the lowest in rank in the, in the household. And yet it was this one. This is the one the Lord tells Samuel and he anointed him on the spot as king. Blessed be Bethlehem, the birthplace of David, the greatest king in Israel's history. Later in David's life, when he was fleeing from Saul, he and his men were camped near Bethlehem, which was surrounded by Philistine armies. They were famished. They were cut off completely. It was then that three of David's mighty men, his best soldiers, broke through the Philistine lines to bring David and his camp waters. Blessed be Bethlehem, the home of the brave, and of the courageous. Long after David's death, in the year 735 B.C., the prophet Micah predicts the fall of Samaria in the passage that we read. In 5.1, he foresees the city under siege. He sees their enemies striking their king with a rod. But then he predicts a new and a better day. And Bethlehem is right in the center of that glorious vision. But you, O Bethlehem of Apophra, you who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth forming one who is to rule Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient of days. The Messiah, says Michael, will come from the little town of Bethlehem. He will be from the line of David. But he will be far more than that, says Micah. He will be from ancient of days, giving us the Bible's first glimpse of the eternal nature of Jesus the Messiah. Hope shall spring forth from Bethlehem, says Micah, for the Messiah will stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord. And the people will live in security, for he shall be a man of peace, not war. This prophecy, of course, was fulfilled in Luke chapter 2, where we read of Joseph returning to Bethlehem, much as Ruth and Naomi did so long before him to be registered for the Roman census. It was in Bethlehem that Mary gave birth to Jesus. And it was in the fields outside of Bethlehem, the same fields that David had watched his sheep by night, where the angels appeared to the shepherds. Once they heard the good news, they exclaimed, let us go, let us go where? Let us go to Bethlehem, right? To see this thing which the Lord has done. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, Ruth's city of hospitality, David's city of birth, the three mighty men's city of bravery, Micah's city of hope, and God's city of self-revelation. Oh, Bethlehem of Apophra, though you are one of the little clans of Judah, though you are of little account in the world's eyes, though even the map makers forgot to put you on the map, Great, great are you in the eyes of the Lord. Great is the wellspring of healing and hope that have flowed from you, and great shall be your wellspring of hope throughout the ages. So it was for Reverend Philip Brooks, a Boston-born and Harvard-bred Episcopalian priest, one of the greatest American preachers of the 19th century. 
Brooks was an energetic pastor, and he loved children with all of his heart and soul, and yet the Civil War that spanned his ministry nearly destroyed and robbed him of the joy of life. At one point he seemed, it seemed like everybody in his congregation had lost someone. A husband, a father, a son, a brother. No family was unscathed by death in this tragic war. Carrying the burdens of all of those funerals, carrying the burdens of all of the deaths around him, took a tremendous toll on Brooks. Finally, when the war ended, it seemed like the nightmare was almost over, and yet immediately thereafter, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, and the country was plunged yet again into turmoil. Brooks, even though he didn't personally know Abraham Lincoln, was asked to de deliver the funeral oration. By the grace of God, he found the words to speak, and yet the experience left him emotionally drained. Spinning into depression, Brooks had nothing left to give. He was emotionally, physically, and spiritually exhausted. And so Philip Brooks, aged 30, burned out, left the pulpit, and went to the Holy Land on sabbatical. On Christmas Eve, 1865, he traveled on horseback from Jerusalem to the little town of Bethlehem. He traveled through the fields where Ruth had gleaned her wheat and where David had watched his sheep, where the angels must have appeared to the shepherds. That night he attended a deeply moving five-hour long service on Christmas Eve in the church of the nativity in the little town of Bethlehem. I remember standing in the old church, he said later, close to the spot where Jesus was born, when the whole church was ringing hour after hour after hour with splendid hymns of praise to God. How again and again it seemed as if I could hear the voices that I knew so well telling each other of that wonderful night of the Savior's birth. That Christmas Eve, God began to lift the weight of the war, the weight of all of those deaths, the weight of that deep depression from Philip Brooks' soul. Shortly thereafter, he returned from the Holy Land, replenished and restored. He said, quote, I returned with Palestine singing in my heart. And he went back to work. Three years later, it was Christmas week in his congregation. And the children's Christmas program was coming up, and they didn't have a program. Some of us may have been there before. <laughs> and so with just a few hours on his hands during that busy of week, the busiest of weeks, and a whole lot of pressure, Philip Brooks sat down and he wrote a poem in which he revisited that night Above the deep of the dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. And yet in the, in the dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hope and the fears of all of the years are met in thee tonight. And then he wrote that marvelous last stanza where he says, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend upon us this day, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. But Brooks still didn't have a tune. So he handed the, the poem to his organist, Louis Dredner, and he asked him to write a tune for it that children could easily sing. And he asked him to do it in a couple days, by the way. <laughs> Louis a real estate mogul in Philadelphia, only a part-time musician, 
struggled with the assignment. Finally, on the night before the Christmas program, thanks be to God, the night before the Christmas program, he awoke with a melody ringing in his heart, and rolled over and wrote it down, and returned back to sleep. The next day, he rehearsed it with six teachers and 36 students. And then on Sunday, December 27, 1868, the children sang, O Little Town of Bethlehem, for the very first time. And as you know, down through the years, that little song, written for little people about a little town, has had an absolutely humongous impact, hasn't it? In that sense, this song itself is a symbol of Christmas. Because at, the Christ at Christmas time, little things come up big. Because that little baby who was born in that little town of Bethlehem comes up big time and time again to this very day. Thanks be to God. He comes up big whenever burned out and broken hearted people like Philip Brooks, who are tired of death and of war, and come, who come to him, come to God and worship humbly asking him to cast out our sin and be entered in. He comes up big in healing and refreshment, for he is the good shepherd who stands and feeds his flock in the strength of the Lord. He comes up big because he is the man of peace in the midst of turbulent times, like Micah's and Philip Brooks and like ours. And he comes up big when little people like Ruth, the immigrant, and David, the boy, and Philip Brooks, the burned-out pastor, and Louis Redner, the part-time overwhelmed musician, and you and I here in this little church, here in this little town of Johnston, Iowa. It comes up big when all of us lay down what little resources we have before the manger and ask God to use it for His glory. God knows that most of us feel insignificant in the face of our world's big problems. What good can we do, we ask ourselves as we survey the massive problems of our world. And yet it is precisely the message of Christmas that it is precisely the people and people who feel weak and small that God works most mightily. So perhaps we need to stop praying, Oh Lord, please take away my weakness so that I can be strong and effective for you in the world. Maybe that's a prayer that we need to let go of. And instead, we need to begin praying, Lord, please take my weaknesses and be glorified in all of my efforts, however small they may be, so that you can be strong in and through my efforts. Take my tired and take my grieving heart. Take my gift for the military family. Take my alternative gift market gifts. Take the gifts of my time and talent that I leave before you. I know all of these are little, we say, but you, O oh God, are great. And we know that you delight and descending to us, casting out our sin, entering in, and being born in us today. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite you to stand, and we're going to indeed sing together, O Little Town of Bethlehem. 